right, right, Matthew's right, going right. to give me a little rough. Are you ready? All right. All right. I'm ready. Are you, are you ready? Yes. You are ready. All right. All right. All right. Well, here we go. So, um, so my name is Robbie Bear, and I am an illustrator. And my name is Matthew Swanson, and I am a writer. So. The two of us work together on pretty much everything. We write and illustrate books together. We run two small publishing companies together. We do some of our books with real live actual publishing companies together. We run a letterpress design studio together. We uh, teach classes, we do talks, we do workshops together. And believe it or not, every summer we spend a month commercial salmon fishing in Alaska together. And we made these together. Yes. Um, <laughs> Not our finest work. But, Don't hold us to it, all right? <laughs> but listen, to the point of our topic, undeniably a joint Unfortunately, venture. Unfortunately, yes, right? it was yes. a joint venture. So, all right, so we collaborate on everything. To us, it's second nature. Our thing is pictures and words, but obviously collaboration happens in many contexts. Every time two people come together to make something happen. It's a great way to expand your brain space and your skill set. And the funny thing is, it's more than just a doubling. Yes, it's actually exponential. Uh, billing ourselves as a creative duo, as we do, flies in the face of centuries of human history that has long held up the lone genius as the gold standard of creative traveler <laughs> inspiration. Right, but look yes. around. Collaboration is happening everywhere because it works and it always has. Yes, as strong and as strapping as this gentleman might seem, mm -hmm. we have the strong suspicion that he was not always working alone. Yes. <laughs> Clearly, he was not working at all. Neither of them were. And why should we deny ourselves access to the power of collaboration when we are so surrounded by examples of the many successes? For example, in your lunch boxes. Yes, on TV. And even in the zippers of each of our pants. Yes. <laughs> collaboration in my pants is why we have three kids. Ah, yes. <laughs> <laughs> collaboration means, quite simply, to work together, to co-labor. As the definition suggests, you take two great things, you put them together, and something even greater happens. Or two not-so-great things. One half of a zipper does not do much on its own. Peanut butter is not so delicious without the jelly. And Bert without Ernie is like Matthew without me, mm. which is to say, not much at all. <laughs> this is humiliating, of course, but it's also kind of true. Before I met Robbie, my stories never amounted to much. I couldn't get them published. I applied to six MFA programs in fiction and got rejected by all of them. Yes, now to be fair, um, I had a little trouble making it on my own too. I had a few freelance illustration jobs here and there, but nobody was knocking down my door. So at one point I was actually living in my car in a parking lot in New Jersey. Oh, that was very sad. It was yes. sad but true, yes. What we found, however, it, it wasn't until we put our heads and our art together that really good things started happening for us. Right, but we have to wonder what it is that we're actually doing when we collaborate. What makes the joining of two people, two minds, two sets of ideas so much greater than the sum of its parts? To think about collaboration in the abstract, it helps to break it down into its simplest form. So let's look at two actors on the stage doing an improv sketch. Right, they're starting from nothing. No characters, no setting, no plot. Their job is to create a scene out of words and pantomime. So one of them has to go first. Maybe in order to get the ball rolling, he says something like, uh, whew, sure is hot by this volcano. Right. Then it's the other person's turn. Now she has a choice to make. She can go along with the thing and say, well, it's a good thing I happen to have this 25 scoop banana split. Yeah. Or if she's feeling uncooperative, she might say, no, it's not. We're in an igloo full of orangutans. Thus leaving her partner completely out in the cold. Her first response held this fragile new world together. Her second one destroys it in an instant. Which is why the basic advice that you give to improv newbies is this, accept the offer. Whatever that other person gives you, take it and work with it. Work with it, but add a little something too. By bringing her cool treat into a hot situation, the second actor accepted the offer. She solidified the scene and then she added a new element. At which point, it's now the first actor's turn to add something else. <sighs> More information, more conflict, more intrigue. So, building on the ice cream, he might say, Hey, that's great! I'm starving! To which she might respond, Oh, unfortunately, I only have one spoon. Ugh, one spoon and two hungry mouths. What does the first actor do? He rolls with it, he accepts the offer, he says, That's okay, because I'm willing to share. All right, so to make this work, the actors have to keep on building on what the other one gave them. So, the scene might continue. Ooh, you don't want my germs. I have a wasting illness. Ah, but so do I, so it doesn't matter. Yay! <laughs> NC. So thank you very much. Right. So, <clears throat> so if they hadn't met each other halfway, we would have lost interest a long time ago. 
As in when she said... Did I mention that we're in an igloo full of orangutans? Right. We think that successful improv happens when there's just enough common ground to hold the scene together and then just enough tension to keep it breathing and growing. We wonder whether the same formula applies to any kind of collaboration, including the things that Matthew and I do together. Yeah, so let's start with the common ground. Robbie and I both started making illustrated books together because we're both so interested in the combination of pictures and words. And we're also interested in asking the same kinds of questions. We share a vision for what we're trying to accomplish, which is to shine a light on these universal failings that make us all human. For other kinds of collaboration, the parallels might be something else. Do you and your partner share an interest in environmental policy, or in social justice, or the quest to make the perfect blueberry muffin? Ah, yes, that's yes. the one I want to learn about. <laughs> so maybe it's obvious, but for a collaboration to work, both you and your partner have to want the same thing at a core level. A zipper only works with another zipper. Yes, even though Velcro is also used to hold things together, it works in an entirely different way. This collaboration is never going to get off the ground. Think about it this way. Unless two lines are completely parallel, they're eventually going to diverge. But it gets even more nuanced than that. Beyond agreeing on what you're trying to accomplish, you also agree on how you're going to get there. For us, aesthetics are really important. Style, tone, voice. Translating style into other kinds of partnerships, do you and your partner share an appetite for risk? Do you have a compatible ethical framework? We think that our collaboration works because we're equally invested in quality, but we're also equally willing to work really hard to reach our goals. And then there's the idea of basic interpersonal compatibility. Right. In other words, do you like each other? You don't even really have to like each other, case in point. You just mostly have to respect each other, right? Respect is the glue that holds a partnership together. It's the thing that makes you listen to your partner's ideas, even when they don't really align with your own. And here's the thing. You can't fake respect. You have to earn it over time. It's really hard to cultivate, and it's really easy to lose. In one regrettable <clears throat> evening. I was in college! We were collaborating! Yeah, you keep telling yourself that, right? <laughs> to sum it up, for a collaboration to have a chance, you and your... You people are sick. <laughs> <laughs> for a collaboration to have a chance, you and your partner have to be on the same page in a few important areas. Yes, so vision and purpose, style and approach, effort and sacrifice, and mutual respect. These are the qualities that anchor a creative partnership and allow it to weather the inevitable storms. But as we pointed out with our actors in the improv, too much agreement fails to move the needle. Right, collaboration works best when the partners start on the same page. But the differences are where the real energy comes from. Why do opposites attract? In some ways, it's really practical. In choosing a partner, you're drawn to the qualities, the skills, the talents you lack. Right, in our case, it's obvious. Matthew writes the words, I draw the pictures. We need both to make our books. In this way, we are like peanut butter and jelly. Yes, I am sweet and gooey, and Matthew is smooth and nutty. Yes. So in that way, we complement one <laughs> each other, each other and, and keep each other in check. The same thing happens when any two people come together to collaborate, whether it's to form a business plan or to design a better kind of helicopter. Or to swindle little old ladies. Which is how we pay our electric bill, all right? Yes. Robbie distracts them, I grab their purses. We each have our role. And roles are really important in collaboration as well. Roles tell us where to focus our energies. The clearer the roles, the less ambiguity there is. Right, and roles are also helpful when it comes to sorting out turf. Um, two people coming together are accompanied by two egos, and egos are resistant to compromise. Yes, we know that what we do would be so much harder if we both worked in the same medium. We have strong opinions about what one another does, but when we don't agree on something and can't reach a resolution, we have the option of simply deferring to whoever's turf it is, which is really helpful. So you're an author and an illustrator, but we actually have to play a lot of other roles as well. There's the glory part of every collaboration, getting to talk to you guys today. Yes. And then there's all the crap that makes the fun stuff possible. Lots of crap. So there's the accounting, the building of the website, the filling of the orders. The making of the macaroni and cheese. Yes, yes. the cleaning of the light fixtures. I don't think I remember the last time that happened. Yeah. happened in a really yeah. long time. Uh, there's the getting the kids up in the morning. If one of us did all of the fun stuff and the other one did all of the chores, um, there might be resentment. Some tension, perhaps. <laughs> Hypothetically speaking, Hypothetically of speaking, yeah. So beyond fairness, it just makes neurological sense to divide and conquer. We read an article in the New York Times a couple of years ago about how couples not just creative pairs, but couples in any kind of long-term relationship basically evolve to share one brain, um, taking on the roles and responsibilities that each is best suited to perform, and then freeing up extra brain space by effectively unlearning the rest. 
So for us, dividing up all of these supporting roles that we have has come down to temperament. Right. Robbie is the tortoise, and I am the hare. When something takes great gusts of energy, I do it. When something takes care and focus and patience, that, that becomes Robbie's job. Yes. So when we have to bind 300 books in one sitting, it's all Matthew. But when we have to fill out our tax return or code a new website, Robbie definitely takes yes. it. Yes. Yes. Hooray. <laughs> so I am about process. And I'm about results. And the thing is, to do what we do, we need both. And maybe it sounds obvious, but the most important point of difference is that we're actually two different people. Yes, as strange as it may seem. Um, no matter how wonderful, fantastic my ideas might be, I am limited by my own perspectives, my own body of experience, my own set of references. There's this exponential widening that happens when you include another person into the mix. When you're all by yourself, you can only see in one direction. You can't see what's coming up behind you. But when you join forces with someone else, you can see in two directions at once. And this is why the idea of the lone genius is so improbable. Yeah, people don't live in a vacuum. They don't think or create in a vacuum. But they do sometimes create their bad first drafts in what feels like a vacuum. Ooh, they're terrible first drafts. Thanks for the vote of confidence, Robbie. <laughs> a couple of years ago, I was working on a story called The Contented, and I brought Robbie the manuscript to have a look. A couple days later, she gave it back to me, asking me to keep an open mind. There was a lot of red ink. I must admit, there was a lot of red ink. She had yes. taken out all the words. Not all of the words. <laughs> Basically all the words. No, almost all the words. It felt like I she... six words. Oh, it yes. felt like she had ripped out my heart. But what she actually did was to shift the narrative emphasis in an interesting way. By taking out the words, she had changed the role of the reader from one of mere spectator to one of being a witness with all of the added complicity and responsibility that goes along with it. So he was doing a lot of describing of things that I could just show. Matthew's story was still there. It informed what I drew and how I drew it. So if you're curious, these are the only words that were worth saving. Those are damn fine words. They are damn fine words, which is why I saved them. Um, so after pouting for a few days, Matthew did admit that my approach worked pretty well. I actually like this book quite a bit. Yes. Yeah. So, so here's another example um, coming from the other side of things. Uh, one time we were working on a book called The Baby is Disappointing. Um, Nonfiction. <laughs> <laughs> so the narrative voice of this story is of two parents kind of openly complaining about how their newborn baby can't do anything, can't run, can't jump, can't uh, mop the floor, etc. So I did my drawings and I showed them to Matthew and he knew right away that they were not working. Um, but his solution wasn't to draw the parents and the baby in a different style. His solution was to not draw the parents or the baby at all. Yeah, we got rid of the parents, and doing that allowed us to shift the satire from a focus on individuals to looking at broader ideas. And we replaced the drawings of the baby with a collage photo of a Cupid doll. Right, so this made it clear that we weren't making fun of some specific baby or some specific set of parents, but instead we're satirizing all of these great expectations that parents have for their kids, and it worked. And because Matthew pushed back, we came up with something that was perfectly aligned with our vision. But the solution depended on two things. First of all, we had to have that shared vision in the first place so that I had something to point to when I was suggesting to Robbie that she might want to start over. And second, <clears throat> because he was coming at it from a different perspective, a non-illustrator perspective, Matthew was able to turn the whole thing on its head. So this lone genius would not have been able to make that book. The solution had to come from a head outside of my own. So, to recap, our partnership is energized by our points of difference. Our differing roles, our differing supporting skill sets, our differences in temperament, tortoise and the hare, and our differing life experiences and perspectives. We think it works so well because our areas of overlap and non-overlap are both maximized. The balance is just right. We wonder if the strongest partnerships in any field are those that have just enough common ground to create the glue and enough friction to keep it you know, breathing and growing. So let's go back to our two actors on the improv stage for a second. Together, they're trying to make something out of nothing. Right, one of them has to go first, and it's a leap of faith. He leads and he hopes his partner will come back with something that will allow the scene to keep growing. And she comes through. She follows our advice and says yes. But she doesn't just say yes. If she just said yes, it wouldn't have been collaborating. It would only be affirming. An affirmation, however nice it might feel, is not the same thing. Yeah, it's basically like saying, yes, you did a great job. Now you go do all the work and then come back to me later and report what you've done. It's negating all of the energy and excitement that can arise from your differences. 
So when it comes to collaboration, saying yes and nothing else is really just the same as saying no. No, I'm not going to contribute. No, you're not going to get any ideas out of me. If Robbie had just said yes when I asked her to read my manuscript, we would never have come up with that surprising solution to the contented. Instead, I said yes, but. Yes, but we might want to take a different approach. Yes, but what if we took this in a completely different direction? So yes, but works in almost any context. Try it the next time your husband comes home with a mounted moose head. <laughs> I still think that would have looked great above the bed. Yes, yeah. but no. And here's the crazy thing. In the context of a strong collaboration, what sounds like a no is often just a useful case of yes, but. In pushing back on my illustrations, even though Matthew was saying no to my specific illustration approach, he was actually saying yes to our shared vision, but he was pushing us in a more interesting direction. And this is why the common ground is so important. Right, we could not have taken these leaps of faith without that really strong foundation. So, something to keep in mind the next time you find yourselves in a collaborative situation. Yes can have a funny way of actually meaning no, and no can actually be the best possible kind of yes. Successful collaborations are an endless sequence of tiny improvisations. Two partners lobbing an idea back and forth, each time adding a little something to the mix. Shared vision keeps them circling the same objective. Mutual respect keeps them anchored when the exchange gets heated. And their differences keep on shaping that thing that they're batting back and forth until it explodes into this entirely new thing that they've been trying to create, something that neither of them could have created on his own. So, regardless of your field or industry, Regardless of your project or your passion, all of you, each of us, can tap into this power. We can step beyond our personal limits into this space of exponential possibility. All we have to do is know how and when to say yes. Yes, but. Yes, but. Yes. So do we do it? We did it. All right, wait, 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 just a second before. <laughs> they weren't clapping, yeah, but, but you can wait. But don't, because <laughs> I want to make sure we all got yes, it. Okay. So, um, Hypothetically, I'm going to ask you a question, yes. and you'll say... Yes. Okay. It's just somehow it works. So, Robbie, would you like to collaborate with yes. me? Yes. In my pants? Oh! No. Yes, but we're not going to do it here. All right. Thank you very All much. All right. Thank you, everyone.